in our last study of Hebrews, which was chapter 3, 1 to 6, the writer of Hebrews revealed two important facts. One, both Moses, who was, who liberated the Jewish people from their bondage to Egypt, and Christ, who liberated the human race from the sin problem, from their bondage to sin, both of them were faithful in the mission that they were called to do by God. The second thing that we saw is that comparing between, when we compare Moses with Christ, Christ is superior because Moses is a type, whereas Christ is the reality. Now turning to verse 7 of chapter 3 of Hebrews, right up to the end of the chapter, the writer of Hebrews turns around and talks about the faithful, faithfulness of the Jews of the Exodus to Moses. We know that Moses was faithful to the mission that God gave him. But the question is, the big question is, were the Jews faithful to Moses? And the sad fact is that the answer is a big no. They murmured, they made his life difficult. And so what the writer of Hebrews is doing, he's using them as an example, warning us, first the Jews of the New Testament times, and by extension us living in the 20th century, that we must not follow their example. So what we're going to do first is to look at the passage, read it, verses 7 to 19 of Hebrews 3, and then we'll look at it in detail. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 to 19. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now, with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Here is a passage that is warning us that we should never give up our faith in Christ. Okay, now let's look at this in detail. We'll start with verse 6 of Hebrews 3, where we were told in our last study that when you become a Christian, you become part and parcel of the body of Christ. You become part and parcel of the house of God. Now in verse 7, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that we must not make the mistake of the Jews of the Exodus. Here were they in the house of bondage, God delivered them, you know, through Moses. Moses was faithful, but they kept murmuring, they kept rejecting the guiding hand of God through Moses. Now, there is a very important truth that this passage brings out. And it is this, the fact that you are Christian, the fact that you accepted Christ as your savior, does not mean that you will be saved ultimately unless you hold on to your faith in Christ until the very end. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that once saved means always saved. The Bible is full of warnings, especially in the book of Hebrews. Don't give up your faith in Christ. 
Therefore, the ultimate salvation that we can experience is only when we remain faithful to our acceptance of Christ to the very end. Jesus himself warned his disciples of this very thing. Let me give you an example. I'm turning to Matthew chapter 10. Here is Jesus talking to his disciples. And please notice, please notice my dear people, what Jesus had to say to his disciples is also for our warning. Starting with verse 17, Jesus is telling the disciples that after he leaves this earth, this is what will happen to them. Verse 17, But beware of men, he said, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should say, for it will be given to you at that hour what you should speak. For if it is not you who is speaking, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you, now brother will deliver a brother to death, and a father his brother to death, his father his child rather, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Terrible that human beings can come down to this level. But now look at verse 22. And that's the verse I want you to look at and understand. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Now this is repeatedly brought out in the book of Hebrews. Let me give you another example of the book of Hebrews. Chapter 10 of Hebrews and verse 38 and 39. Please notice the clear statement made in this passage concerning our ultimate salvation. Verse 38 of chapter 10 of Hebrews. Now the just shall live by faith. That is he who is just through faith shall live. But, it goes on to say, if anyone draws back, that is anyone who says goodbye to faith, my soul has no pleasure in him. And then verse 39 goes on to say, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition. Talking to Christians, to believers. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So my dear people, our faith needs to be endured unto the end. That is why I want to repeat what I've said many times. The most valuable thing we possess in this world is not our assets. It is not our bank account. It is not even that plastic card that you can buy almost anything in this country. It is our faith in Christ. That is the most valuable thing you possess. That is why we must never give up our faith in Christ. And that's the whole purpose of the book of Hebrews. To prepare a people to stand the crisis that is ahead of us. In the case of the Jews of the New Testament, the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. In our case, the time of trouble that is coming upon us pretty soon. So verse 7 and verse 8 and verse 9 goes on to say, Don't harden your heart as the Jews of the Exodus did. You know, God delivered the Jews with mighty signs and wonders. And yet, they were full of unbelief. As I mentioned earlier, in our earlier study, the Exodus is a type of salvation. When the Jews crossed the Red Sea, which symbolizes baptism and Moses symbolized Christ, they said goodbye to Pharaoh, who symbolizes Satan, and they said goodbye to Egypt, that of course symbolized the world. But you know, as they were walking towards Canaan, very interesting, their hearts were not for Canaan, their hearts were back in Egypt. Oh, we miss the Kentucky Fried Chicken and the cucumbers and the onions and all kinds of the good things that they did. They forgot that they were slaves in Egypt, that God had delivered them with a mighty hand and was taking to the, them to the promised land. And so they murmured and complained. Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for supper. Folks, God never intended them to be in the wilderness for 40 years. The reason why they were there was because of their unbelief. And so 
what the writer of Hebrews is doing is taking their example and telling us, like he told the Jews of the New Testament, don't ever follow their example. So going back to Hebrews 3, we find that the writer of his Hebrews, under inspiration, you know, is using the unbelief of the Jews of the Exodus as a warning to those living in his day and a warning to us living in our day. That's what Hebrews 3 verse 7 to 11 is all about. I'll repeat that again. Let's read it again. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you'll hear his voice, the pleading of the Holy Spirit, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, referring to the Jews of the Exodus, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I saw in my wrath that they would not enter my rest. Let me explain to you something that you may not be aware of. When the Jews of the Exodus arrived at the borders of the promised land, Canaan, it's only about two months after they left Egypt, they sent the church board, that is the 12 spies, because they represent the church board, the leaders of the church, to see the land. And they came back with a wonderful report. They said, surely this is a land of milk and honey. But these 12 men were divided. What was the division? Ten of them said, there is no way we can take the land. Those people of Canaan are like giants and we were like grasshoppers. But two of them, Caleb and Joshua, said, You know, Lord, you know, people, God is on our side. Let's walk in. So the church, the whole family had to make a decision. When I say family, I mean the whole nation of Israel had to make a decision. And they took the side of the ten. That is why God sent them back into the wilderness, because their hearts were full of unbelief. You know, 40 years later, when they ultimately came into Canaan, one of the people they met was Rahab in Jericho. And you know what she said? When you came here 40 years ago, our knees were trembling because you see, we had heard how your God had delivered you from Egypt, the most powerful nation of the ancient world. And we were willing to give you our land. And then you turned around and took off. Why? And I don't know what answer they gave them, but I have, obviously they could not give them a good answer. The reason they turned back is not because God failed in his mission. It is not because Moses failed. It's because they were full of unbelief. And that is the passage. That is why we are being warned. Look at verse 12 of Hebrews 3. Beware, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Folks, we human beings are living in enemy territory. We are constantly being bombarded by Satan to turn our backs on Christ. Let us learn from the Jewish experience, from the experience of the Exodus. And let us do what verse 13 of Hebrews 3 says. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ only as we hold on to our faith of Jesus, to Jesus Christ unto the very end. Now, let me turn to a passage that is saying the same thing, but... Which is, which is going to buttress what we have just covered. I'm turning to 1 Corinthians and chapter 10, where Paul, I mentioned already, uses the Exodus as a type of salvation. Listen to the first 11 verses. It's a big passage, but it's very important because it reveals what Hebrews 3, verse 7 to 19 is all about. Chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to read verse 1 to 11. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. 
all of them drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spirit spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ but with most of them that is those who were 20 years and above with most of them God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness now these things listen to this these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as some of them did as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play now verse 8 let us commit let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did in the day of their rebellion nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpent nor murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer but now look at verse 11 now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come and the end of the ages my dear people is our day we must be very careful that we do not commit the mistake of the Jews of the Exodus and that is the whole purpose of the passage we are studying a warning against the sin of unbelief you see every sin that you and I have committed was paid by by Christ you know there are 12 different Hebrew words in the Old Testament for sin and five in the New Testament Greek all of those come under seven categories of sin Jesus died he paid the price for six of them but there is one sin Jesus did not die for it's often referred to as the unpardonable sin Christ referred it to the sin against the Holy Spirit because he's the one that convicts us of the gospel that sin is the sin of unbelief now don't confuse unbelievers with that sin because not all unbelievers have committed the sin of unbelief unbelief is a verb it's a deliberate action of the will and Christians are possible to commit that sin it is not only something that's committed by unbelievers it is possible for a Christian to turn his back on Christ it is possible for us to say goodbye to our salvation in Christ by the sin of unbelief and this whole passage that we are studying today is don't allow this to happen because folks you say goodbye to Christ you're saying goodbye to your salvation how then are we to now look at the next passage please notice what it says here I'm referring to the anger of God look at verse verse uh, 10 of Hebrews 3 it's I read therefore I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways I want to pause here and look at the word anger or God's wrath we must never never project our concept of anger or wrath to God because human anger is lashing out you know out of emotional emotionalness but when the Bible speaks of God's wrath it has a complete different meaning because God's ways are not our ways in fact Isaiah tells us there's millions of light years that separate God's ways from our ways so I want to explain to you what God's wrath is because it's important in this context that we are studying and the best passage that deals with God's wrath is Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to the end of that chapter so I'm going to turn to Romans chapter 1 and in verse 18 Paul begins by making a statement listen to the statement chapter 1 of Romans verse 18 for I am sorry for the wrath of God that is the anger of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth in unrighteousness now please notice what Paul's put first he says the major problem with mankind which has led to the wrath of God is ungodliness the result of that is unrighteousness in other words man's problem is not unrighteousness because that's the fruits of ungodliness and ungodliness is simply meaning 
turning your back on God. And then Paul explains all what he means. He says, the human race had a knowledge of God, but they refused to hold on to that knowledge. They deliberately turned their backs on God. Listen to verse 21 of Romans 1. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Protesting, pro professing rather to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, and so on. Now the question I want you to look at is, how does God react? Because that's what God's wrath is all about. How does God react when he turned, when men turned their backs on him? Three times Paul explains to you us the wrath of God. Verse 24, verse 26, and verse 28 of Romans 1. Let me read you all three of them. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to honor their bodies among themselves. Then in verse 30, 26, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up over to a debased mind. So what is Paul telling us about the wrath of God? When you deliberately, persistently, and ultimately reject Christ and go your own way, God does not bring fire down on you. He says, okay, I will give you what you have chosen. Because you see, God is love. And love does not force anything upon us. In other words, God says, I did everything for you. You refused me. You chose to be on the side of Satan. And therefore, you will have to die with him. In other words, the wrath of God is not lashing out at us, not bringing down fire and, and brimstone upon us. The, the wrath of God is giving you what you have deliberately, persistently and ultimately chosen. That is why I would like you to look at Matthew 25. There in this chapter 25 of Matthew, Jesus divides the human race in only two camps, believers and unbelievers. But listen to what, what Jesus says here in verse 31 of Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. In other words, the gospel will divide the human race in only two camps. While Jesus died and redeemed the entire human race, because of the freedom of choice he has given us, there will be some who will reject the gospel. And therefore, the gospel will divide the human race into two camps. I read in verse 33, And he will set the sheep on his right hand, that is the believers, but the goats on his left. Listen to what he says to the sheep, that is the believers, those who have accepted Christ and whose faith has remained faithful, endured unto the end. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right hand, that is the sheep, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You see, our performance has nothing to do with this. Our performance is only the fruits of salvation. But when it comes to salvation, it's based on what God did first in his plan before the foundation of the world and then by the reality in the birth, life, death and resurrection of Christ. But then I want you to notice what he says to the goats, to those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Listen to verse 44. Then he will answer them to the... Uh, sorry, verse 41. Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. God never prepared that fire for the, devil, for, for the human beings. He prepared it for the devil and his angels. But if you deliberately, persistently, and ultimately reject the gift of Jesus Christ, then you are deliberately choosing 
to be on Satan's side and so God will give you what you have chosen. That is the wrath of God. Now, having said this, what should be the conclusion of our study on this very important passage? According to the first half of Corinthians 10, which we, we, studied, we looked at, Exodus is a type of salvation. Moses is a type of Christ. Crossing the Red Sea is a type of baptism. As I mentioned earlier, Pharaoh is a type of Satan and Egypt is a type of the world. When the Jews crossed the Red Sea and were heading for the Canaan, their hearts were still in Egypt. And the reason they died in the wilderness is not because they were sinners, but because they committed the sin of unbelief. Forty years later, my dear people, God brings the Jews once again, and this time on the shores of the Jordan. And if you look at the book of Joshua, God says something very interesting. He says to Joshua, when you cross the Red Sea and the Red Sea, sorry, the Jordan, when you cross the Jordan, the Jordan will do the same thing as the Red Sea. The waters will be parted. Take 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan into the promised land and then take 12 stones from the wilderness and put it in the Jordan where it stood. Now what was the meaning of this? You see the life that the Jews brought with them was the life of Egypt which cannot enter heaven because this is the life of the flesh. What God was saying to, Moses, uh, to Israel through Joshua of course was you cannot take this flesh into heaven. It belongs to the grave. It belongs to the cross. The 12 stones that were taken out from the middle of the Jordan to the promised land was the life of Christ. You know, in 1975, I was crossing the Jordan. Of course, now they have a bridge. And I stopped at the middle of the bridge and looked down to, and an Israeli soldier came up with a gun to me and said, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for the stones. And he said, what stones? And I said, don't you know your history? Oh, yes, he said, my mother believes in that stuff. Folks, you cannot take your old life to heaven. It belongs to Egypt. It belongs to damnation. What we must take is the new life that Christ has given us in Christ. And so it is my prayer, folks, that your faith will remain faithful unto the end so that you will not make the mistake of the Jews of the Exodus. And that is my prayer for you in Jesus' name. Let us bow down and pray to our Lord Jesus Christ for his wonderful gift. Loving Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the history of the, of the Jews of the Exodus as an example to us that we may not make the same mistake. We realize, Lord, we are human, we are weak, and the devil is constantly trying to destroy our faith. Help us to keep our eyes focused on Christ, whom to know is life eternal who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.